skip verse 4. I want you to skip verse 4 for time's sake. Okay? Here we go. Sweet, we go on. 
church, everybody. It's good to be saved. <laughs> I know, and I knew she was thinking it, too. That's why I said, oh, God. Uh, welcome to church. <laughs> hey, it's good, good to be saved. Good to be in church. Amen, brother. Amen. All right, so well, I'm going to yeah, try to keep it as short as possible. Please continue to um, you know, uh, go by the COVID guidelines. Um, you know, Keep that safe distance between one another. And um, thank you so much, by the way, for your patience with all this stuff. We know none of this is convenient. None of it is you know, kind of hard to breathe in this stuff. But we want to be a blessing to others. We want to have a good testimony uh, to SES as well. So please continue to do that. Uh, church services, they're going to remain the same moving forward. Um, however, uh, Wednesday, 5 p.m. So I'll just go through them again. Wednesday, Bible study, 5 p.m. We're actually going to have street preaching. Oh, we did get the okay Amen. to do street preaching this next Wednesday at 5 p.m. So that'll Amen. be at the, our usual corner. If you have any questions about that or you need directions, feel free to come to me, Pastor Rob. Uh, we'll be happy to help you with that. And then um, 7 p.m. is going to be discipleship. And 8.15 will be Bible study on Wednesday. Sundays, we're still doing first service 11 a.m. to 12.30. And the second service immediately following uh, with like a maybe five or ten minute break in between there till 1.30. Uh, the Zoom schedule uh, is ongoing, praise the Lord. Those have been such a blessing. So uh, we have, by the way, if you're nervous about being on the Zoom, you know, you don't want to be on the screen, you don't want to be called upon to talk or something like that, we totally understand. And yes. so feel free, like, if you want to just be a part of it, or like Brother Tom the other day, he was cooking dinner trying to be a part of it. He had his screen blacked out and his... You know, his microphone muted, and he was just listening. So Amen. the point Amen. of this thing is that people would get a blessing, right? 
So don't feel any added pressure. If you, if, however you can participate or get involved, um, God will bless you for it. Amen. So the youth meeting is Fridays at 8.45 with Brother Rob. Ask him for details. The Korean meetings are Saturdays at 5 with Brother Tom. Uh, so you can go to him if you need anything. And our uh, general weekly church Zoom meeting, um, those are, I believe, Mondays at Currently, they're Monday at 5. They're subject to change, but yeah, uh, as of now, I think Monday at 5 if you want to join that. And there's uh, there's going to be a special guest preacher on there this next week, so you definitely want to tune into that if you can, all right? Um, and you can ask Brother Jared for details on that. The ladies' Zoom meeting, that is Thursdays at 6.30 p.m. And uh, any ladies, uh, any way that you could be a part of that, uh, the Lord will bless you for it. And those will be, once again, Thursdays at 6.30 p.m. Okay. Um, so, summer camp update. Okay. Summer camp update. For anyone that's not going for the entirety of camp, um, that's the easiest. It's just $220 for the whole week, everything, right? So, hopefully you're going for the whole thing. You just figure it out. It's $220. It's easy. For any of those, myself included, Folks that are not going for the entire time, I'm going to give you the formula to figure out how much you're going to owe, pa you're going to owe pastor, okay? So uh, you can just come ask me afterwards, too, if you didn't get all of it. But here's the formula. So if you're so per meal, whenever you're going to come, it's going to be $5 per breakfast, and then it's going to be $10 per lunch and $10 per dinner. So once again, that's $5 per lunch. $10, uh, I'm sorry, $5 per breakfast, $10 per lunch, and $10 per dinner, as well as $10 per day that you're going to use the camp. So if you're not staying at the camp, you're going to stay at a hotel or something, the easy formula, how you're going to figure out how much you owe, basically how many meals are you eating, how many days are you going to be there. So once again, if you have any other questions about that, feel free to come to, to me. I can uh, repeat it to you, let you know afterwards. Um, and yeah, so that'll be how you can figure that one out. And then just another friendly reminder, you know, singles in the church, we, we, we do uh, highly recommend that you stay at the camp if at all possible because it's a whole other experience. Uh, it's good to be around the brethren the whole time, you know. Married, married couples, we, we got an out, you know. We got to be, with, we, we, we got to have our, you know, all time significant other and it can be uh, more comfortable that way sometimes. So that'll be the summer camp update. Now, uh, if you'll go to your memory verse with me, we're in Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. And last week we were looking at uh, verses 17 and 18. And this week we are, we're getting close to the end of Romans 14. And it's been such a blessing going through this chapter. Uh, so we're in Romans chapter 14. And we are going to be looking at verses 19 and 20. It's like whenever, whenever anyone asks you, like, hey, what's your top five you know, restaurants of this? Or what's your top ten? And you're like, I can't even pick. I can't even get them in. That's basically these verses when you're going through Romans 14. They're all so good. So in verses 19 and 20, the Bible says, Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. Amen. Verse 20, for meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. Yeah. So that's huge right there. I mean, you talk about whatsoever uh, is not a faith is sin, and how that single verse will save you from a whole world of mess and questionable issues in your Christian life. Well, we know that, and Paul's talking about, you know, we, we know that meats and all these stuff and uh they're they're not they're nothing to us you know idols that we yeah, come across right. they mean nothing to us you know what i mean we, we serve the king of kings lord and lords yeah, but if it's going to be a rock of, of stumbling a stumbling block to another brother sister in christ you might be weaker in the faith yeah. you got, that's what you should be thinking about uh, not how it makes not not about you yeah. but how how it looks to another brother sister yeah, yeah. in christ yeah. and when you're when you start to think like that that's when the Lord's going to take you to a whole other level spiritually. That's right. Yeah. So do your best to memorize those verses there. With that, our special is going to be Pastor Kim, accompanied hey, by Brother Brent. Come on, brother. Hey, Let's go, brother. I'm sure a lot of you know this song. And uh, 
Just feel free to sing along at the chorus, I guess. <laughs> I just, um, what keeps me very humble is songs like this. Yeah. And uh, if the Lord ever blesses you too much, don't ever think you're too much. Always think that He's too much for you. If you could see what I once was, if you could go with me back to where I started from, then I know you would see a miracle of love that took me in its sweet embrace and made me what I am today, a sinner saved by grace. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. When I stood condemned to death, He took my place. Now I grow and breathe in freedom. Each breath of life I take, loved and forgiven, back with the living. I'm just a sinner, saved by grace. How could I boast of anything? I've ever seen or done. How could I dare to claim as mine the victories God has won? Where would I be had God not brought me gently to this place? I'm here to say I'm nothing but a sinner saved by grace. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. When I stood condemned to death, he took my place. Now I grow and breathe in freedom with each breath of life I take. Love done forgiven, back with the living. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. And now I grow and breathe and freedom with each breath of life I take. Love done forgiven, back with the living. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Woo! Good to be saved, brother. All right then, so we're going to take up the Lord's offering. I'm going to ask Brother Randall and Brother Jonathan to take up the Lord's offering for us. Then Brother Randall, if you can open up the offering with the word of prayer, please. All right, Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. And as always, thank you for that precious blood that was shown across the Calvary for us. Yes, Lord, thank, thank you. Thank you for just... Um, Put, put your will to the side and do it the Father. So I thank you for that. Thank you for saving us. Amen. I pray that you uh, just bless the offering, Lord. Uh, use it to your honor and your glory. And, and just uh, thank you for a good Bible-believing church. I Amen. Pray, pray that you just bless our pastor and he gives us the word of God, Lord. We're, we're a hungry people and we really bless need God, you, Lord. Show me. Thank you. And, and just can't wait to see you one day. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Thank you for everything you do. Bless the offering. Name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
chapter 14, please. Luke chapter 14. It's always very encouraging to see everybody at church. Thank you so much for coming. If you can make sure before you leave that you are greeted properly, and if all of you can make sure that you greet everyone properly, it's been a while since we've seen some people. Amen? Amen. Brother. Amen. So if y'all can do that, that'd be great. All right, Luke chapter 14. The Lord laid it upon my heart to preach this message. And uh, I hope that this will help you, especially now we're at a time where we're very hungry. During this time of the coronavirus, it has sucked a lot of our spiritual energy. And a lot of you have went through trials and your own personal problems in life. So I hope that this message that it will help you. And it's kind of like what our missionary stated in his letter. We take what we have for granted. And I hope that while you have the meal to enjoy, that you would take full advantage and enjoy every opportunity of it. Because meals like this don't last forever. And especially if the second wave does happen, then there could be restrictions again. So let's look at Luke chapter 14. And then we'll read verse 16, Luke chapter 14. And we will read verse 16. The word of God reads, Then said he unto him, a certain man made a great supper and bade many and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to prove them. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor, and the maimed, and the halt, and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. Amen. For I say unto you, that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Now, this is actually a parable that Jesus told to the people. And in this parable, as you can tell from the story, there is a great master who's opening up a great supper, However, when his servants are sent out to give this great news, the people, you'll notice that they all began to make excuse. Some of them were poor excuses, others were legitimate excuses. However, you'll notice that despite of the excuses, whether legit or not, when the servant came back at verse 21, it doesn't change the fact that the supper meal to enjoy was wasted. It did not change that fact whether it was legit or not. And because of that, the Lord who spent so much time preparing this supper and is such a great supper where people can enjoy and experience the happiness of the fellowship and the praising of the Lord and to just felt and to combine together and strengthen each other's bonds that the people could not come to enjoy it. And as a matter of fact, it shows that the Lord was actually emotional because he spent time and he was so excited that he became angry. And because he became angry, unfortunately, he said, then we're going to go for the nobodies out there. We're going to go for anyone else out there. And so then the master tried to invite anyone else he could find far and near or those who were of lower status to come. And then he sadly stated that those who were first bidden to enjoy the supper, the Lord made up his mind. They're never they're never going to taste my supper. And if you heard the explanation of this parable, I'm sure it's pretty much self-explanatory that you can see over here that the Lord has provided us a supper and he invited us to come and dine with him. Amen. That's the reason why church is necessary so that believers can gather together and to fellowship and to bond, to praise his name, to worship him forever because he deserves the glory. Amen. He deserves the glory. It's one thing that you praise him personally. That's a very prized possession and you should never neglect that. But God, he wants everyone to be together to just say we worship you together. 
That's what gives him greater glory, greater praise. It's one thing to have one person attending your audience at your graduation uh, celebrating you, but it's another thing where there's a thousand people over there celebrating your graduation. And that's the normal reaction God would feel, see. That's a normal reaction God would feel. He wants to see everyone come together to praise his name. And you've got to understand that there was much great sacrifice. Listen up. There was much great sacrifice on the part of the person who started the church, the people who first came to church, the people who put the first labor and effort into the church, and the people who actually fell out of church and came back to keep it running, and the people who were not given the credit, yet they were the ones who gave the money that rescued the church. Their attendance was the one that rescued the church. Their winning of souls was the one that kept the fruits going for the number of souls saved for this church. The people who preach when the pastor couldn't preach were the ones that kept the church going. There was much sacrifice and effort and labor, especially the Zoom meeting leaders. I thank God for them. The ladies Zoom meeting, the youth Zoom meeting, the Korean Zoom meeting, etc. You don't know how much time that the people, your pastor on this pulpit and the people who prepared the messages for you through Zoom or through these meetings when the pastor couldn't or our guest speakers who flew miles away to preach to you, you don't know how much time and sacrifice and effort was made so that they can give you a supper to enjoy out of their own normal schedule and busyness in life. So I hope that we understand here what we have is very important and we will not let things that the devil slip in our lives during the coronavirus situation prevent us from enjoying the great supper of the Lord. Let's all bow in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, will you please fill within me the power of the Holy Spirit and wash away my sins with your blood? God, these words are nothing. They're nothing, Lord. They're just words unless you move me. And Lord God, I pray that with the people here that the message will speak to them and that we will unite and keep attending, encouraging each other, keep the work of the Lord going because we don't have much time, Heavenly Father, until you come. And when you come, Lord, will you be able to say of San Jose Bible Baptist Church, hey, all the other churches out there, you see this church? They kept going. The people kept coming. They kept trying to do soul winning, etc. So I pray that will be our testimony. Rather than the church being rebuked at the judgment seat of Christ, where God says to San Jose Bible Baptist Church, I was coming real soon. You haven't been doing anything for me. I pray that you'll fill me now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, the first thing that I want to start off with is let's look at verse 16. Verse 16, notice it says, Then said he unto them, A certain man made a great supper and bade many. Now, notice over here it says he made a great supper. So you've got to understand that what we're experiencing right now in church, and this includes onliners too, it was made. It was not just given or granted or that it was a handout. It was made. So you've got to understand that there was great sacrifice made to pay the bills for this building, for the people to prepare the message, for the people to prepare the technology and set up, and not only that, the people who are willing to face the mistakes that they made trying to keep the services running, and then they still face criticism for it. It's amazing, even onliners, it's amazing that uh, I don't want the onliners to feel bad. And I appreciate your input when you mention to us if the volume is low or we have technical issues. That way we can be aware and improve it for you. But it is sad that other onliners are not aware of that and they would just whine about the technical issues when you don't know how much hard work that the people who actually do the technology do things. You really don't know. Some of you might think all you have to do is just buy this technology product. All you have to do is this. But trust me, we even contacted professional people who are involved with tech services and they still have issues. Do you know why? Because the devil attacks. It's as simple as that. Right. So you've got to understand that you don't realize that how much work and effort was made, made to give you this opportunity to come to church and to worship God. You don't realize how much the devil has attacked the people who tried to help out the pastor 
or the pastor trying to help out the member, you don't know that these people, what the devil did in their lives because they don't parade about their problems. What they do is that they maturely take in the attacks and then they just stay strong for the Lord to try to help you and not think of themselves. And I think that's the uh, problem is that a lot of us, we only think about ourselves. We don't think about others. And we got to realize how others have made, made the sacrifice so that you can enjoy a good meal today. Yeah. And if you doubt that, then all you have to do is think about the sacrifices made by the martyrs, by the martyrs who had little children who died for Jesus too, where they were burned at the stake, where they were persecuted, imprisoned, and tortured. Why? So that they can keep Bible-believing truth going. Wow. You would not have this message today had it not been for the blood that was shed. Waldensians would memorize literally chapters from that precious, most holy book so that you can have the precious word of God available in your hands today. Uh, you know why you're able to enjoy Bible study verse by verse, word for word? It's because of the word for word they memorize. The sacrifice is made. You don't realize that preachers and pastors, and I'm not even talking about myself. I'm talking about pastors before me who sacrificed and went through demonic attack after demonic attack, yet they grit their teeth, they stayed strong so that they can reach people like me to be fed so that I in turn can reach people like you to be fed. See, you don't realize how much sacrifice was shed so that we can enjoy a great supper today. And if you really still, if you still don't think so, then all you have to do is think about the great sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when Jesus Christ, he faced hell on earth, he faced any, the, all the worst kind of physical, mental health, all kinds of torture, spiritual pain, all kinds of pain and attacks that you can think of. And the Lord Jesus Christ, he made you this great supper to worship him today, to fellowship with one another, to praise his name together. And if you think that this is, should, uh, this is just simply granted to you, this is just a given, you got to realize this, you're not even worthy to worship him. Did you not realize that? In the Old Testament, the high, there was only one person who can have the boldness to worship him before his throne. And that's the high priest. Only one. Only one. And not only that, he had to make sure that his own life was in check spiritually. And not only that, he had to make sure they had to have the blood of the lamb and all these ritualistic ordeals done to a proper 100% so that he can worship God properly. But we don't have to do all that. Jesus Christ just bled and died on the cross for you. And all he wants you to do is just come and worship him. That's it. You got to realize how much sacrifice was made, 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 so that you can enjoy a great supper of San Jose Bible Baptist Church today. It's not just uh, granted or given or like uh, take it as it is. It's made for you, made for you. You got to realize that everyone goes through pain and sorrow and everyone has their own personal issues. They, all, they have their own fights within the church and we all have our issues in life. But you got to realize that so did the people who made the sacrifice so that you can enjoy the supper. You got to realize that these people went through the similar issues like you, but they swallowed it so that you can enjoy the meal. They were the ones willing to take in the pain and the attack so that they can feed you and help you. You got to understand that. You got to think about others and not yourself. Another uh, one is at verse 17. Verse 17, it says over here, And sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. Now, notice over here that because the supper is made, and you got to realize that when God makes the supper, it's not just done just like that. It's done through years and years and years of sacrifice. You know how long it took for you to get this salvation by the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ? It took nearly 4,000 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Took nearly 4,000 years so that he can give that available sacrifice to you. How long did it take for us to have the King James Bible? 1611, right? Then we got the King James Bible, the pure word of God in our hands. How long did it take to plant a Bible-believing church in local areas? How long did it take for San Jose Bible Baptist Church to develop fruit 
in this church. And for those of you who have attended church the first time, you know how long it took. It took eight years. Eight years of making. And now God, the master, opens up in his arms and says, come and dine. Amen. Come, it is now ready. Enjoy the meal. People, you're at the, you're at the best time, actually. You're at the best time in our church where you can enjoy the fellowship, where you can praise his name together, where you can get comfort from the brethren, where you can be prayed upon, where you can have the teaching and the preaching. I mean, a lot of people's spiritual levels are growing. Sure, we still have issues. We still have our problems. And even this pastor, but I'll tell you what, it has gotten much better compared to eight years ago where the spiritual condition of the church were able to do more things for the Lord and more ministries and now is not the time to bail out now is not the time to miss out the meal I mean eight years it was starvation and for some of you uh, before you attended a Bible believing church knew what that was like under that starvation now would not be that great time to starve now would be a great time to what make up for the past eight years for the past all of your life that you are starving. As a matter of fact, so then attending church and working in the church and doing things for the Lord, it should be way more than what we're doing right now then. Mm -hmm. Because we're making up for the lost time that we've had. So all things are now ready. Why reject the opportunity? Why miss out such a blessed opportunity where you can praise his holy name? where you can worship the Lord, where you can have a brother and sister in Christ to talk to and to encourage you and to comfort you and to help you. Miss out a time where you miss out preaching of the word of God. Well, I got online. Well, praise the Lord for the onliners who didn't have Bible-believing preaching, but for those of you who attend church, there's a total big difference with direct in person compared to online through a screen. Yes, sir. We need that supper, we need that meal now, now. But the flesh does the opposite. The flesh says now is not a good time. Now is not a good time to help out the church. Now is not a good time to attend church. Now is not a good time to go out soul winning. Now is not a good time to be called to preach. Now is not a good time to do these things. Tomorrow, later, Hey, flesh, it was eight years long for San Jose Bible Baptist Church. No, now, not later. I've already done enough later, later, later. I got my time now, and COVID-19 ain't stopping me on that. I'm making up for lost time. Man, you notice the blowout? Uh, did you remember the blowout? Spirits united as one. This was beautiful, man. This was beautiful. Did people in the church have issues? Do preachers have issues that you can nitpick and point out? Duh. Anyone could. But some of you could not pick it out probably or some of you forgot. You know why? You were not thinking about something negative to find. You were just so lost in the bliss of only focusing on the positive of worshiping the Lord, of fellowship, and hearing the preaching. That's why you experience that joy. So if you all would just get lost in the supper of the Lord and not find out the problems within the church, find out the problems within your life, find out the problems with the preacher, then you can be lost in the bliss of the joy of the Lord. And you can enjoy the supper of God and say, thank you for the food, Lord Jesus. And then COVID-19 happened all, all of a sudden, right? All of a sudden. Maybe the devil knows that this church has gotten something from the blowout and they were going to make great strides for the Lord. And maybe Satan, that's why he did this COVID-19. Guess what, man? This is a time that you can't let COVID-19 stop you when you are just already this high. You're on, you're on the Jesus drug after the blowout and you're this high and you just want to go higher now. Yeah. Can't let something stop you. You can't let something stop you. You're already this high for the Lord. Keep going higher. Enjoy the bliss and the presence of the Holy Spirit and keep it going. Because why? Now's the time. Not later. Now's the time. Now is the time. Yeah, amen, brother. Somewhere, someone at the back over there. Now look at verse 18, verse 18. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. Now, did you notice over here? It's not just different people giving excuses. 
God sees that all as all with one consent. It's a consent. It's an agreement together. And God bunches them all as one began to make excuse. However, if you look at verses 18 and 19 and 20, just look at the excuses. Honestly, it's not all as one. They're different excuses. Like one is pretty legit. Like at verse 20, I have married a wife, therefore I cannot come. <laughs> I cannot come. 19 and 18, I pray thee have me excused, you know. Like verse 18 is kind of a, a lame excuse. I bought a piece of land, so I want to check, check it out. Why don't you check it out after eating, you know? Verse 19 is semi-legit. I bought five yoke of oxen, so I got to try them out. And then 20 is like, oh, totally understandable. Therefore, I cannot come. All right, your excuse is understandable. <laughs> One thing that you're going to notice is that everybody has excuses, and they're different levels. Here's the point. The point is, is that everyone has their own excuse, and maybe your excuse would be really legit. And you're not like other fleshly members who come up with the excuse, oh, I'm just too tired, therefore I cannot come, or something like that. It could be something like, uh, I married a wife, therefore I cannot come, right? Or it's some kind of big legitimate issue. It might be a legitimate excuse. However, it does, look what God sees at verse 18. They with all one consent. See, the point is this. The point is, uh, it doesn't matter... What our excuses are for being unable to come to church. What God sees that as is all with one consent agreement. As making excuses. Wow, sometimes the Lord can be pretty strong, right? I mean, Jesus said one time, uh, one person said, Lord, I want to follow you. And Jesus said, follow me. And then the guy said, but let me go uh, first and bury my father, etc. And then Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. What in the world, man? Why in the world? Why in the world would Jesus say that? You know why? Because what God wants. See, God, when he damns a person in hell, he's not seeing as a really good person or different levels of sin. He sees that you're lost or you're saved. You're holy and righteous or you're in sin and without God. See, what God is is usually just black and white. That's it. He sees you either in or out. That's it. We all have our excuses. We all have our understandable circumstances and situations. But you see, it's, you're all still at that one page. You're not in God. You're out. And that's what God sees it as. It's all just different levels, though. But God, he wants you in. He wants you to serve him. He wants you to glorify his name. He wants you to get involved in his work, involved in his ministry. Try to glorify and magnify him because he is worthy. He wants you to enjoy his supper. But we all have our excuses. We all have our excuses. And what helped me a lot is that um, when, whenever I'm going through my own personal issues in life, what helped me to be uncompromising about doctrine or about attending church, to my knowledge, I never skipped a church service all my life, praise the Lord. I could probably remember uh, one time, but this is like many years ago, maybe when I was six, you know, so that kind of memory is inaccurate anyway, so I wouldn't know, right? <laughs> yeah. Now I remember I was like so sick, I, my nose would be dripping, so I'd make sure I sit all the way at the back, you know, and then use a handkerchief, you know? So I would do something like that. But the point is this, the reason why I became that kind of person was because I was thinking if, this, uh, if I focused on my personal issue, how understandable it was, how hard it was, or the, how other people would understand, or how God might understand and give me a leniency and will let it slide. When I start thinking that way, then it motivates me, see, to skip church. But then when I start thinking about like this way, look, it's worshiping God, and I can't let anything stop me. Then see, that's what drives me and gets me going. It's what drives me and gets me going. Now, what I'm saying is this is just my own where I'm at. I'm not saying everybody to do that. And for, uh, for crying out loud, if there are certain signs of COVID-19, you know, just stay at home, okay? <laughs> stay at home. So uh, don't get me wrong. So there are situations that are understandable. And man, for crying out loud, this pastor understands. We can't beat everybody in the head for crying out loud. Hey, where were you at church? You know, you don't know what that person went through. Oh, yeah. If you went through what that person went through, you know, you'd probably be worse. You'd probably be worse. 
But let's get out of uh, human understanding over here and let's just try to focus on God. This is just you and God. This is just you and God. This is not people judging you because human has human nature as brethren. We got to love each other, carry each other's burdens. But through preaching God's word, because this is him speaking, we got to look at his mentality. And what he wants is you enjoy, you don't enjoy. And then from there, you can know deep down inside your heart with the Holy Spirit guiding you about making excuse or if it's not. The thing is this, is that I notice one thing about these excuses. If you look at verse 18, 19, and 20, you notice that it doesn't matter what level of excuse is. This is a universal truth. The universal truth is no matter how bad the excuse is or how legitimate the excuse is, that excuse is more important to the individual than God's supper. Let me repeat that again. You'll notice that whether it's a bad excuse or a very legitimate excuse, the person already made the choice and the decision that the excuse is more important than God's supper. Good teaching. So you notice over here that when that's why God, he sees that you get it now where God's seeing it as black or white. Because remember, what, the, what is God? God's like all about me, child. Nothing of you. So God, see, all he's, see, all he's seeing is that. So then when you're going through your kind of excuse in life, whether it's fleshly or even a spiritual excuse or a legitimate excuse or a semi-legitimate excuse or a poor excuse, it doesn't matter. The point is over here is that you prioritize that thing more than God. And see, God, he wants number one in his life. Pastor wouldn't dare do that. I mean, I don't set up a punishment system or uh, a level system or a charter system about people attending church and, you know, all this kind of stuff. I don't do that kind of stuff because you know why? It's not about me. And a lot of pastors, they're like IFB dictators, you know, trying to make sure that, okay, we get, you got to give more money. You got to give more money. You got to attend more church more often and stuff like that so that they can increase their ministry so they can have a larger empire. Not this preacher because it ain't mine. Amen. It ain't mine. Amen. But I'll tell you what, whose empire this belong? This belongs to God. Yeah. That's why he has the right. That's why you can understand his thinking, his mentality that, hey, are you giving all like you should at the offering plate? Are you attending all like you should? Are you giving your surface, your effort at all as you should? See, that's why God can say that. But not this preacher. So I don't want you to think that this is the preacher's saying that we, have, we should have an increase on this one. No, God will take care of me. Amen. And I've been, I've been through services where I've gained and lost all and just dropped to one or two people. I'll be fine with the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. So I could care less. But I'm saying this for you, for you, because this is you and God. And because you and God is so important, what does God want? Are you really giving all to Him? That's the thing. There are... Excuses that people go through in life and the common ones that I have seen where people weren't able to come to church is worldliness, it's busyness, it's some kind of trial and pain that the Lord allowed and the devil severely attacked, or it's some infighting in the church. It's usually these four things. Right. It's usually these four things. It's either worldliness or sin, it's either busyness, it's either infighting within the church, or it's within some kind of trial or pain that the devil allows. Right. Uh, the devil starts attacking you with. And it's very sad whenever these things happen, I'm like, ooh, so I wonder how the trend will go in church. Trust me, just remember these four things, people, and then you'll see a trend. You'll see a trend. And then usually it never fails. And that's what Satan has always used throughout churches. All the churches I went to is those four things. Those four things. And then either people will slide a little more or they'll never come back to church and it becomes incredibly sad. And all you can do is, all you can do is just what? All you can do is just pray. All you can do is love the brother and sister and just let God do the work. That's it. That's all you can do. There's so much that this preacher wishes that he can do. 
where he can solve every problem and every issue and make the church perfect and help the person to try to attend church. And some of you know my heart. Some of you know that I would drive for hours just to pick up one person to try to help the person come to church. You know that this preacher would pick up four to three different people and go to four different locations and be his own church ministry in a Honda Civic car of all things to bring people to church. That was my bus ministry, bless God. You know this preacher, you know this preacher would do that. I would do anything in my power to do that just so that you can enjoy God's supper. God bless you, preacher. You know that this preacher would do that. But then God, he wants me to get off of me. And he wants to say, hey, that person needs it, child. That person can't be dependent on you. That person needs me. And that person has to have his or her own guts and courage and strength through my power to yeah. come to church. Thank you, Lord. That's good. Amen. That's one thing that I realized about the Lord. So you'd understand that this preacher would do everything in the world, but I can't. You know why? Because I am not God. Because I'm not God. The only person who has the power to make a difference, yes, it is God, but he doesn't take over your free will. The one who has the ultimate power at the end to make fate happen, circumstances happen, is you. Right. You are the one. Because God gave you that. The blessed gift, but also became a great curse, was free will. Yeah. Free will. That's why pain happens. That's why imperfections happen. You know why? Because this is the result of free will. That's the result of free will. Mankind makes mistakes. They commit sin. That affects and hurt other people around them. F free will. It's a curse, but it's also a blessing because God wants you to have that power to make the difference in your life. He's not going to be the ultimate dictator to control every thought process in your life. He gives it to you. He gives you the free choice to love him. The free choice to make the sacrifice. The free choice to grit your teeth, to develop strength. And remember this, you're not alone in it. You're never alone in that. You have the power to make the choice. But the power and the strength, if you need it, he'll give it to you from heaven. If you'll just ask him. If you'll just pray to him. And he'll give it to you. I want to urge people in here is that whatever the devil is throwing in your life or whatever test God is pulling you through, this preacher wants to speak out of great love because he's seen it so much for the past 32 years is that please, please don't let whatever situation you go through in life overrun and rule your life forever. You have the free choice to enjoy the presence of the Lord. You have the free choice to enjoy his presence, to be happy, to find joy in his life. He doesn't want you depressed and miserable through the bleak situations in your life. He wants you to experience the joy in him. If you must grieve, if you must cry, if you must have a complaint, tell it to pastor. No, don't tell it to pastor. I don't want to hear. Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. He says, tell it to him. If you have a grief, sorrow, complaint, or trust issues or whatever, I could care less. You tell it to Jesus. Amen. And he'll understand that. And when you dump it to the Lord in prayer, don't let those negative things rule your life now. Now try to find happiness in the Lord. Yeah, good, when you dump it to the Lord, beg him and ask him to give you strength, to give you grace, to give you some light at the Amen. end of the tunnel, to pull you through church, to make you do great things for the Lord. But see, he can't do that if you won't ask him. Yeah. And the reason why you won't ask him is because there's something that's ruling or dominating your life. It's that situation. Let them not be the king over your life. You have the power of free choice to conquer. I can do all things through Christ. You can have victory in Jesus. Bless God. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. God has given you power over that wicked one through his holy and mighty name. You can do it. Get up and fight. You can do it. Don't let them rule your life. It grieves my heart. Someone fell away. Someone messed up in life in sin. It hurts me so much. Don't let them ruin your life forever. Oh, how sad. How many times have I seen where people get messed up in sin or some kind of trial or issue in life 
or infighting in the church or, or worldliness or whatever. And then it's gotten to a point where because I've seen it too much, now it's become an immune thing a little bit. It's gotten so used to now. And then the ones who are hurting are actually the members. The members say, will say, oh, pastor, you know, it's so hurtful. You know, we missed a lot of people in church. You know, why aren't they coming, etc." And then, you know, sometimes what your pastor would say is like, it happens. It happens. Why? Because I've seen it too much. And then now some of those members are experiencing that too. Don't let it be a machine that dominates and rule over your life. You want to be happy? You want to find the joy of the Lord? Then get it. Don't run away from it. And a lot of times when God gives you joy or happiness in life, a lot of times we try to keep looking at negative things so that we don't truly enjoy the joy of the Lord. It's so easy, if you're going to be very honest, it's so easy to find critiques with the blowout. Oh, look at the room. Oh, it's too small. And then the meal was so hard to prepare, et cetera, et cetera. The logistics were too tough, et cetera, et cetera. It's so easy to find all that. But you know why you couldn't find that? Because you were too lost in focusing and concentrating on the positive. You hardly concentrated on the negative. But if you keep concentrating on the negative, then no matter how great the positivity level or how great the blessing is of God, or even if he dumps $10 million to you right now, if you keep focusing on the negative, you won't enjoy it. Yeah. You won't be happy. Right. Don't let excuses be the king over your life. You have the power. You have the freedom. You have the choice. Verse 21, so that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, notice over here, it says being angry, said to his servant. You know what's also sad is this, is that because you got to understand this. And the only way you'll understand it is, is if you do it yourself. Let's say that you put in great sacrifice, great effort, so that a group of people can enjoy it. But then this group of people, for some weird reason, the devil starts to send things in their lives. And then this group of people, they're not able to come. They're not able to help you out on some kind of event that you worked so hard to prepare. And probably you were doing it for years. And probably you made a lot of mistakes and sacrificed your busy schedule and time to do it. And then if these people did not come and you see empty seats, how would you feel? It's not like that you would judge the brother and sister, but you can't help but there is a level of frustration, right? Right, right? You've got to understand that's the same thing that's totally understandable in this passage too. Supper is made, remember. It's not given or it's just taken it as it is. It's made. Sacrifice, sweat, blood, effort, effort, constant effort, patience and waiting of years was made. And then if there's empty seats, there's going to be a level a frustration. You got to understand this is that the people who sacrifice the time with the technology, onliners, I hope you're listening, and not just the people in this church, but the onliners too, the sacrifice and the efforts made where we went through frustration after frustration to give a proper service, then no one comes to enjoy it. You can't blame, the pe uh, can't blame the people who made the sacrifice to feel some sort of level of frustration, right? You got to understand that. You got to understand that. That's why it's so important that because when supper is made, remember this, remember the people who put great sacrifice and effort into it. And if you were to do that, then you would, what you would do is you would say, I would come and enjoy the supper. Yes. You know what I would do is that uh, there are people's homes who would sacrifice the time and effort and in Korean culture it's normal if somebody uh, works so hard to prepare you a great meal to enjoy uh, what my parents taught me and trained me was always to be grateful for the food and to not say oh you know this is not my taste or you know uh, I'm not gonna eat lettuce or something like that no my parents taught me you eat everything and don't you leftover boy you're gonna eat up everything yeah. Yeah. and that's what I did and that's what I did. Why? Because the person made great sacrifice and effort to give the, me the meal, so I thank the person. So you got to understand this is that it is common courtesy and manner where people who put great sacrifice and effort that the what you could the least obligation is is to enjoy it, be happy about it, be thankful for it. 
And not only that, here's another level. Encourage those people too. I want to I want to thank this church so much. I want to thank this church so much that the guest speakers who sacrifice their time, their church service so that they can be a blessing to our church, not their own church, but to our church, that you all made them feel welcome, that you all encouraged them during the middle of preaching, that you all thanked them. I thank God for this church that can do that. Let's do that because we've done that for the blowout. This should be every time. Let's do this. That's the kind of church we are. Let's show them uh, that uh, in liberal, wicked California, you know how capable we are as a Bible-believing church. What a great church. I remember uh, one brother, uh, you know, he's from way out in the south, all right? Hated California. But as soon as he came to our church, he said, when, look, California, as soon as I just drove past it, he didn't even meet the people, you know? You know, so he didn't even meet them. He said, I just felt weird driving to California. But when I came here to this, to you people, I mean, you took the weirdness away. I just feel welcome over here. I just feel normal. I remember that. And actually, that meant a lot to me. And that made me very proud of my church. Let's keep doing that, church. If you look at verse 21 and 22 and 23, notice that because the people who were invited would not come, what did God say? Look at this. This is important. God's not going to keep begging you. God's going to, uh, because our God is, look, I need to get the work going. We need to get the work of the Lord going. Why? Because we waited too long. Because God's a God of patience. And then when he has his right time set, he wants that right time to be done now when he says now. So then if no one would stand up to the gap, here am I and send me and then take that position now, then the Lord's going to automatically find someone else. And what did he do? He doesn't care how messed up the person is at verse 21. He don't care. Maimed, halt, blind, poor. He don't care. He's like, come in. Some Bible believer says, well, I don't want to uh, come to a Bible-believing church in California. It's so wicked over there. And God will say, okay, then I'm going to have, hey, homosexual, why don't you come over here? Get saved in the Lord Jesus Christ and you work in this church. Amen. Or we'll pig anybody out there. Amen. Don't think you're too good. Amen. And you know what the Lord will do? Sometimes the Lord will set a little child to do the work of the Lord. You know that? I've seen it where... Some churches, because grown adults can't keep the street preaching ministry going, it's the kids that would keep it going. Praise the Lord. You know why? Because the Lord's saying, hey, man, I mean, look, there should be a level of some kind of esteem over here because God's picking someone lower than you to do his work. Amen. And we got to wake up and say, man, I got to get myself moving. Now, this is one thing I want to say to onlineers so that they can feel encouraged, all right? So that way they don't feel like that they've been convicted and preached against. But to onlineers, I want to say this to encourage them that you got to realize that uh, verse 21, 22, 23 is applied to onlineers. You know why? Because in this home country, people want to say no to church. Yeah, yeah, Within good. the church, people will say, I can't come to church mm -hmm. or do the work of the Lord. So then... God says, go out through Malaysia, go out to Thailand, Amen. communist China, the Muslim countries, and then go to uh, all other states of America. And then, you know, those people, they'll be hungry and ready Praise to listen Lord. to the word Amen. of the Lord. Amen. Some of these people will be the one to throw in the comment, man, I wish I had a church like yours. You guys are so lucky to have a church like that. Yeah. Do you know how many comments there are like that? And if you don't know those comments, then the people who do the emails know that. Thank you. They know that the people that, look, what we have is very precious over here. Yes, and we cannot let the work of the Lord go to waste. And if you let it waste, then God's going to seek out somebody else who will appreciate it, who will say thank you, who won't make excuse. I mean, look at this. The, you see the maimed over here, right? How are they going to travel from far away, the maimed, you know, to come to the Great Supper? See, they don't make excuses, they go. You know why? Because they realize the supper is that much more important than their legs. The supper is that much more important than their situation, than their excuse, than what they're going through. The supper of the Lord means that much to them. That's real good. 
And trust me, you know what, uh, what I fear? This is one of your pastor's fear. Your pastor's fear is that people will think that his church is solely an all-nine ministry. It's not a local church. I've told pastors and people who know me know this, is that I am a pastor like them, local, Bible-believing, working with people in the community. And online is secondary. Look, people, you are priority number one. Online is secondary. You got to realize that. Street preach people get saved, not all through online. It's still on the streets. It's still through knocking on doors and visitation. It's through our friends and we invite people to church. This is not a online ministry, all of it. It's never. It's just another addition that we can use. But if God took away the online ministry, I think that we'll still be okay. Amen. And we'll still be worshiping the Lord and we'll still see, we'll still see souls saved. Amen. And we'll, we still can see some growth. But you got to realize this. My fear is that that kind of hope that I have about we being a local church would be gone. And that it will truly be an online ministry. And only those who are off the highways and the hedges and those in faraway countries, they would be the only ones to listen to this pastor to eat the meal. Wouldn't that be sad? It would be tragic. It would be tragic that a person who is so far behind spiritually than you, when you fall away, and this person was a baby Christian, whereas you were like growing more and more and more, that that person grew a lot more than you years later. You know why? Because the Lord is looking for somebody else now. That's right. And if you, won't, if you won't take it, the Lord will take somebody else. And verse 23, it is very sad that at verse 23, it says, compel them to come to my house. Yeah. Compel? Yeah, that's good. Persuade? Mm -hmm. Onliners, you understand this too. It has to take a compelling title yeah. of a video. It has to take compelling drawings to get you interested in the work of the Lord. People, it had, to be, it had to take some compelling from some brother or sister to bring you to church or the pastor to bring you to church. It had to take some compelling from someone to bring you to church. Did it have to be the accommodations of a building to compel you to come to church? Did it have to be the accommodation of, hey, I have a great number of people. Did it have to take an accommodation of people around my age? People of my gender, people of my background, people similar to my age or uh, people similar to my culture. That had to compel you to come to church. I'll tell you what, that's what, how the mega churches grow. They find ways to compel people to come. You know what? You know all you need is? All you need is a surrendered heart to the Lord. Here am I, send me. And whether you're in a church of over a thousand people with an air-conditioned church building or two 80-year-old grandmothers in a small little dinky little room, you'll still worship the Lord together in contentment and happiness. Right. Why? Because if you have that surrendered heart, all you want is to taste the supper of the Lord. Last part of verse 24. You don't want this. Remember this. This is not Pastor Kim saying to you at verse 24. Pastor Kim always says to you, doors always open. Doors always open. You can come. That's not San Jose Bible Baptist Church or the people in this church. They'll say, praying for you. Hope you can come back. So this is not us saying to you, but this is God saying to you. God says, verse 24, that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. It had to take COVID-19 for the people to understand about coming back to the Lord's Supper. God says, uh, none shall taste of my supper because uh, people skip church anyways, right? So, you know, I think that they won't mind if they start skipping for three months. None shall bid of my supper. You don't think God will do that? What did he do with the nation of Israel? Shut them out for, 90, uh, for more than 2,000 years. Two millennia. Shut them off as a nation. He don't kid around. He'll say, don't come anymore. One day you'll reach the age of 70 and you'll be bedridden. And God says, you're done. Wow. One day you're going to find a different place to move at. And God says, you're done. One day you'll have a new trial and situation that'll come up. That'll make it impossible for you to come. 
and God says, don't come. It will happen. It will happen one day. No one shall taste of my supper. Don't let that be you. Because it does happen. Is the Lord, do you see that? Do you see that? San Jose Bible Baptist Church, you got to understand, have been praying and loving and trying to follow up. And they're trying to keep the door open. But just like Noah's Ark, those people could not keep that door open. God shut the door of the ark. And when judgment, that's what the Bible says, God shut the door. And when God shut the door, Noah and his family could not open it and rescue the people out there. You got Pastor Kim and San Jose Bible Baptist Church trying to keep the door open, praying to the Lord, begging God that God will move in, bring them back to church. And Lord, will help them, please, please, please. And we're begging God and we're saying, God, give them another chance. Give them another chance, please, Lord. I mean, that person still has a desire to serve you. That person can do great things for you. Please, Heavenly Father. And then God's saying, it's almost closed. And then it's probably that one arm of that brother and sister who's still been praying for you or followed up with you. Just that one arm of the brother and sister who prevented God to shut the door completely. And then God's like, okay, that, hand, that arm's not going to last forever. You know that. It's going to hurt. And it's going to be more difficult for you to keep up with them. Let it go. There we go. Shut. And no one can come in. Is that door about to close? Or will you run forward right here on the altar and shut it open and say, let me in, Father. Every head bow and every eye shut. Is that door about to close? The Lord laid upon your heart. The altar call is open. The Lord laid upon your heart. Feel free to come down here on the altar's floor. You can also pray in your seat. However way the Lord leads your heart, you can pray in your seat or come down here on the altar's floor. Is that door about to close? Will you run or will you, are you the one sprinting now to that door? Are you the one sprinting now to that door and say, God, not yet. Here I am. Don't shut the door. Brethren, think about your Zoom meeting. Think about the soul winning opportunity in this church. Think about the Sunday service or even a Wednesday service. Think about times where we have fellowship with the church. Think about the summer camp or the blowout. Think about those things. Will you run to that door before it shuts. When it shuts, it's shut. God, I want to come back. And God, don't doubt him. He could say no. You're done. I'm going to have to take you to a different path. Different way of using your life. But not through this church anymore. I never disclosed this, but let me just disclose this now. It did happen. You don't think that doesn't happen? It did happen. The first church that I pastored was at uh, Palm Springs. And then you know what? Despite of the sacrifices that were made, we couldn't keep it going forever. The Lord shut the door. He shut it. Didn't you know this pastor thought this church door was going to shut? After three years of pastoring and then it dropped to two people, I thought that it was shut. And I was going to shut it. You know what prevented it from shutting it? Just one or two people who put the arm on the door and convinced me that it's not a shut door yet. You would not be in this church today had it not been that, those few. You got to realize that this, is, this open door is not something we just take lightly or just an option. I can always come back if I want. No, it's going to shut. It's serious. God says you either eat my supper or you don't. Keep the door open. Keep those prayer meetings open. I heard that the men started to do a little prayer meeting thing. That's awesome. Will that keep going? We got back to visitation and street preaching, which makes me happy. But will that keep going? Will we see the people who used to come to visitation street preaching come again? Zoom meetings has been very, very fruitful. But guess what? It can slide. You know why? Because... As that verse says, each one began to make excuse. And then pretty soon it's all with one consent. That's how the Lord will soon see it as. What a blessed supper. Don't, 
this meal, church, this meal is greater than any situation you can go through in life. Tasting God's meal is greater than any other thing in life. And if you don't see that, just remember this. Those martyrs who burned at the stake and lost their children through torture and death, they thought it was worth it just to protect God's supper, his holy scripture. They thought it was worth it. And here's the unfathomable thought. Let me close it with this. The unfathomable thought is that G Jesus himself thought it was worth it. When he knows that you and I would fail, yet Jesus himself would think it's still worth it to give you the supper of serving him, using your life for him after he dies on the cross. He thought it was worth it by giving up his life and his holiness through torture and death. He thought it was worth it. How can we not think that the supper is worth it of all things when people bled and gave their lives? Father God, this sermon is so important, Lord, because that way this, this church can keep going to do great things for you. God, wouldn't it be a blessing, Lord, that we can keep feasting till the rapture and when we're at the marriage supper of the Lamb, we can truly enjoy a better feast up there with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.